Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our webinar. My name is Nela Haldemann. I am an assistant science editor for The Scientist, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Today, our speakers, Drs. Karen Abbott and Dr. Susan Bellis, will discuss how cancer cells modify glycosylation pathways to survive and how to target tumor-specific glycans for early cancer detection, prognosis, and therapeutic development. The recording of today's webinar will be archived on the scientists' website, and we will send you a link via email within a couple of days. Please do note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. Before we start, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor. Factor Laboratories pioneered and leads the market in protein labeling and detection, serving life science researchers with tools that help them precisely visualize and study tissues and cells with reagents for glyco sorry, glycobiology, immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence, and bioconjugation. Founded on a growing portfolio of purified lectins and lectin conjugates, Vector Laboratories supports the ability to profile, characterize, and capture complex glycans in biological systems. To learn more, please visit their website at vectorlabs.com. Vector Laboratories also currently has an opening for a glycobiology scientist. If you're interested, you can find more information about this job opportunity in the career section on their website. Our sponsor has also provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we have posted these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, um, let me introduce our first speaker for today. Dr. Karen Abbott is an associate professor within the Department of Translational Medicine in the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine at Florida International University. Here, she is also the Assistant Director of the Translational Glycobiology Institute, which mentors the next generation of scientists and promotes collaborative translational research. Dr. Abbott has been a leader in the field of glycoproteomics and biomarker discovery for more than 14 years. She received her PhD in biochemistry at the University of Georgia in 2004. During her postdoctoral training, Dr. Abbott was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship from the American Cancer Society to develop lectin capture methods for the analysis of glycoproteins from human tissues and plasma using mass spectrometry methods. Dr. Abbott's lab is supported by an alliance of glycobiologists grant from the National Cancer Institute to study the contribution of complex carbohydrates to tumor development and progression in ovarian cancer, and by an innovative molecular analysis technologies grant from the NCI to develop novel diagnostics for early cancer detection uh, based on cancer glycoprotein biomarkers. Before I hand the stage to you, I just want to make sure that your slides are up and running. That looks great to me. So with that, um, Dr. Abbott, please take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction and welcome to the webinar. This is my first webinar and I'm very pleased and to be here and I hope to give you um, some useful information. Um, I'm assuming that we have a broad background of listeners, um, so hopefully um, you can apply something that you hear today to your own research. So I uh, just want to also uh, let you know that I'm in beautiful Miami. It is a partly sunny day. And so um, it's a really, a, a, I moved here last year and I find it to be a great place for research. Um, I'm having trouble getting the slide to move to the next slide. Um, let's see. Uh, do you want to maybe try to um, unshare your screen and reshare your screen. Let's see, how do I do that? I go um, here. I, I will stop sharing it for you. Okay. You can just uh, restart sharing.
Okay. Is that, did that move? Yep. Yep. That moved. Great. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So getting back to our story, um, if you don't follow glycobiology, I'm going to give you a brief history. Um, glycobiology has been a science for many, many years, dating back to the 1960s. But in 2001, we were thrust into the spotlight with the cover of science. Um, and that same year was the year that they sequenced the human genome. And so um, since 2001, there has been more of a focus on glycobiology um, and there's been an explosion in technologies that have helped us to advance our science. And um, in 2018, Feb's letter featured the cover on glycobiology research, new horizons in glycobiology research. So um, I wanna let you know that there is a lot of innovation in this field. There's a lot of really smart people moving into this field and we welcome everybody to glycobiology. Now, as a glycobiologist, I tend to think of the cover of cells coated with glycoproteins and glycans, but the rest of the world doesn't share my view. And so I found this image from a pharmaceutical website and it's showing you the plasma membrane and you can, you can see that they have a few glycans here and there, but the majority of the figure is these large blue structures, which are the proteins. So most researchers take and have a protein centric um, view. Um, and is that real or not? I will tell you it's not. This is an electron micrograph of an actual cell surface. And you can see that this very dense coating at the cell surface called the glycocalyx is composed of glycoconjugates, um, glycolipids and glycoproteins that extend and protect the cell. So there, there is a large proportion of proteins and lipids at the cell surface that contain glycans. And so we don't understand why this hasn't really been moved and addressed into therapeutics um, other than it is complex to study. So you can think of these glycoconjugates analogous to the mortar that holds bricks together. And these structures are very important for allowing cells to properly interact with other cells or for cells to interact with their environment. And you can imagine that if you're building a house, you want that mortar to be there to hold those bricks together. And without it, um, as in the case of cancer, I'm a cancer researcher, and these glyco structures are dramatically altered. And so the building starts to collapse. We all know that cancer starts in a single cell with genetic modifications. But researchers back in the 70s and 80s found that when they used RAL sarcoma virus to transform fibroblasts, they discovered very quickly that glycans actually um, start to change very early. And this is, um, as I mentioned, it's the mortar holding the cells together. So you can see that immediately the cells start changing shape. And these glycan changes were detected by um, really simple means, polyacrylamide gels and showing sh shifts in the migration of proteins. So we didn't have the technology at this time to identify those glycan changes, but you can see that if we could find a way to block the effects of those glycan changes early, you could prevent invasive cancer. So most of the um, gly glycobiology um, is very prevalent in cancer um, research. And most of the common used markers are in fact glycans or glycoproteins. You may see your favorite um, protein on this list. Um, CA-125 for ovarian cancer, um, cancer antigen 125 as it's known, is actually MUC-16. And it wasn't discovered, the protein um, wasn't discovered until years after the marker had been used. And these antibodies that are currently used um, to detect CA125 don't address the glycosylation, even though the mucins are heavily glycosylated proteins. Another problem with these um, markers currently is that most of them don't have the sensitivity that they need to be used for widespread population-wide screening. And so it is hoped that by looking at the glycosylation changes, we can improve the sensitivity of these markers in the future. And 
As most of you may not be glycobiologists, I'm going to start and just orient you to um, the way we refer to sugar structures. Um, a lot of older journal articles you may come across, um, they draw out every structure and that can become quite large and um, overwhelm your eyes. So we've gone to a color format and everybody in the world uses this format to denote different sugars. And this is a small sampling of the different kinds of sugar structures that you can see on proteins from the essentials of glycobiology, which a new edition should be released in the spring of next year. Um, and uh, another thing you can notice from this is that there are such a diversity of glycan structures. Some of them are charged, like the heparin sulfates and the chondroitin sulfates, and large and polymeric, and others are smaller. Um, I've highlighted the glycan structures that my lab studies. We are particularly interested into GPI anchored proteins, which is a unique lipid and glycan linkage of proteins to the cell surface. Um, the enzyme that adds this linkage is overexpressed at very high levels in most cancers. We also study in-link glycans, and you're going to hear about some in-link glycosylation today um, from me, and you might hear about some from the next speaker. Um, what you should know is that in-link glycosylation um, has a lot of different forms. This is just an example structure that they've put together for this figure. Um, there are many different types of in-link glycans, and most glycoproteins that have in-link glycans have more than one site of glycosylation, and all of the sites don't have the same structure. So that adds complexity to glycosylation also. Um, my lab is also very interested in the mucin type O glycosylation, as that changes in uh, the cancer that I study as well. And, um, we're interested in o fucose, which is, is not even on the figure. Hopefully it'll be in the updated figure in the spring. And um, I have a collaborator that specializes in this type of glycosylation. And you'll hear a little bit more about that. So I study ovarian cancer and um, several years ago, it was discovered that ovarian cancer actually originates in the fallopian tube, in the mullerian cells in the fallopian tube. And this discovery came about because um, women with um, BRCA1 and 2 mutations were having um, hysterectomies. And when they would take the tubes out, they would see small lesions in the fallopian tubes. And that came to the theory that potentially it is a precursor lesion. And so Dr. Ronnie Drapkin has done a lot of research on this and really proven this fact. Um, so it's pretty well established now that the most prominent form of epithelial ovarian cancer known as high-grade serous ovarian cancer actually originates in the fallopian tube. The other thing that ovarian cancer has is a lot of genetic um, mutations and a lot of genetic heterogeneity. And so these tumors are bound together really by the most common mutation is p53 mutations. Um, there can be mutations as I mentioned in the DNA repair genes BRCA1 and 2, um, p10, that gene is frequently deleted. All of these genetic alterations, while they are common to the tumor, the problem is they don't necessarily drive the tumor genetic potential. So that's really where I think my research can play a role because I really, um, it, it, it's turning out that the glycans can drive the tumor genetic potential. The other issue with ovarian cancer is that for many, many years, the same treatments have been used. The, the um, platinum containing drugs and the taxanes. Um, and these drugs have been used in different combinations and they're very effective. The ovarian cancers are very sensitive to these drugs, yet the problem is um, most of these cancers will recur. And very often when they recur, they recur with chemo resistance. And so there have been um, some innovations in um, PARP inhibitors and other drugs, but there really needs to be more innovation for drugs for ovarian cancer. And so that's where one area that I feel like my research can try to um, improve. As I mentioned, re re recurrence of disease is a continuing problem and chemo resistance. And both of these are thought to be due to stem cells. So traditional chemotherapy, as I was discussing, can kill bulk tumor, but is not effective on the cancer stem cells. 
And so these cancer stem cells still persist and they will come back. Um, and, and, and we need drugs that can target the cancer stem cells. You can see here that many markers for cancer stem cells are in clinical trials currently. Um, I just want to point out um, this notch right here. Notch receptor is one of the receptors that controls the cancer stem cell populations. And you're going to be hearing about that today. And there are some clinical trials um, for certain drugs, the gamma secretase inhibitors, um, but um, there are no drugs right now that are targeting glycosylation. And you'll see why that's so important. So if you are studying an, uh, a certain disease and you want to identify glycans that might be changing, you're probably asking yourself, how do you do that? How do you identify glycans that are changing? I'll just share with you my own experience. When I was a postdoc in Michael Pierce's lab at the University of Georgia, he had um, cloned the gene. Um, it's known as GNT5 or NGAT5, which is a glycosyl transferase. And um, it was, it's known to add a type of structure that leads to a larger structure called polylactosamine. And these structures form the binding sites for galactins. And these, these are endogenous lectins in your body that bind to the sugars and they can cross link receptors and activate signaling pathways. And one of them is the um, RAS MAP kinase pathway. And that pathway leads to elevated levels of ETS transcription factors, which turn on the GNT5 gene, which makes more of the glycosyl transferase, adds more of that sugar structure to the receptors, and in, it's basically a self-propelling pathway. So this is one example of how glycosylation changes in certain diseases, including cancer. Um, so in, when I started my lab, I decided to look at the levels of different glycosyl transferases using a technique called glycotranscriptome -trans analysis. And this is quantitative real-time PCR because glycosyl transferase genes are present at a lower level and even small changes can have an impact on the activity of the enzymes. And so each sugar structure that you see is added by a separate enzyme. So you can measure the levels of enzymes that are changing and then you can get an idea of the structures that you would expect to see. Then we use lectins. Um, we, we, we use a variety of plant lectins. There are over 800 different plant lectins now, I think. Um, and they all have different specificities. Most of them oligomerize into these tetrameric structures and form a binding pocket that recognizes certain sugars. Some of them are more specific than others. You're gonna hear about a lectin today that we use that is pretty specific for a certain structure. But the one thing that lectins can't they really can't be used therapeutically because number one, they are most of them are toxic to human cells. But a lot of them are, and they're very large, and they won't enter cells, and they can't discriminate between um, tumor structures and normal structures. So, just to let you know, while they can tell you if a certain particular glycan is increased in cancer, um, they will also bind to um, that structure present on, on, on a normal cell. RNA-seq is another good way to look at global changes in glycosyl transferases. And a lot of this data has been um, done on clinical tumors and has been deposited into databases. Cancer BioPortal is a, is a good database. So if you are studying uh, and you want to see if a certain glycosyl transferase is changing in the cancer that you're studying, you can put that gene code in and check in, on the databases. So um, once you have a glycan structure that you know is changing, um, how can you use that knowledge? Well, my lab is known for targeted glycoproteomic analysis. And what that is, is we take a specific structure that is changing and we target and pull out all of the glycoproteins that have that structure. And then we identify them by mass spectrometry. This is a thermo orbitrapic eclipse mass spectrometer. We have one of these at the Translational Glycobiology Institute. And um, the best way to start a discovery project is to use tissue. And so all of these papers that I've published over the years, we always use tissue for discovery. Um, the reason for that is serum or plasma is very complicated. There are, I know there are a lot of researchers that use that as an initial discovery tool, 
but um, I find that the tissue is good for discovery and then you can validate in um, using the plasma and then go on to develop biomarkers. So what are biomarkers? Biomarkers, they can be for therapeutics or um, prognosis or diagnosis. Another way that glycans change structures that's not really been truly appreciated is epigenetic changes. So epigenetics is, a, it does not change the amino acid sequence of a protein, but it changes the abundance. And there are so many ways that epigenetics affects the genes. And there's been so much research in this. And I think in the future, this is really going to become important because we know that lifestyle changes impact epigenetic changes. Um, and your actual ancestry um, affects epigenetic changes. The glycan structure you're going to hear about today is an epigenetic change. And the change is in the gene called MGAT3. And this is very confusing and why glycobiologists do this, I don't know. But the gene is MGAT3, but the protein enzyme is known as GNT3. So if you're going to search for the gene, you would have to search with the gene code. It is elevated in ovarian cancer. And when we first discovered this back in 2008, we didn't know why. Um, and a, a, a researcher's group in Europe came out with a paper that shows that it is regulated by hypomethylation in ovarian cancer. And what MGAT3 does is it adds this bisecting sugar. And so this is normally expressed in your brain and in your kidney. Um, and knockout mice that knocked this gene out were completely normal. So it's, it's something that it's, it's not required for life, but it has certain functions in your brain. We just don't understand all those functions yet. But in the case of ovarian cancer, it would be a good target because um, it's not going to affect other functions. So when we found out that this gene was elevated and this structure was elevated, um, we teamed up with Michael Tiemeyer and Kazuhiro Oko. You're going to see throughout the presentation a lot of collaboration because this type of science requires multidisciplinary approaches. And these two had really figured out ways to um, analyze the glycan structures. So we took the tissues from the ovarian cancer patients and we took two different kinds, the high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which is the most common, shown here in green, and then the endometrioid ovarian cancer, um, which is the next most common. And the combination of these two forms comprises almost 100% of ovarian cancers, epithelial-based. And you can see from this data that the shocking thing is that they have very similar structures. And the other shocking um, fact was that these structures are very abnormal and the way that they are abnormal is the fact that they are super asymmetric. You can see here that this structure only has one branch. It's missing an entire branch. There is a lack of galactose. Most structures in your body that are bisected that might come from your kidney um, are going to be bisecting um, structures that are perfectly symmetrical, and these are not. So we knew right away that this is a very, very significant finding. So my postdoc at the time, Hiba Alam, she had gotten her PhD in a lab that did stem cell research. And so we started looking into what would be the function of um, GNT3. So she used a strategy where we express shRNAs constitutively to knock down the expression of GNT3. And then we could see what happens. And we found that these spheroids, so you can grow ovarian cancers on non-adherent dishes and they'll form these giant spheroids. And the shape and size of the spheroids is dependent on the amount of cancer stem cells. And you can see here that when she knocks down GNT3, you get much smaller spheroids compared to um, the control. And when she looked at those spheroids, they had a reduction in transcription factors that regulate stemness. She also found that they were um, reduced for notch receptor and notch receptors products. Um, so we knew that this type of glycosylation was impacting the notch pathway in ovarian cancer. And this was published in 2017. If you look at the notch pathway, Pamela Stanley, who has been studying this pathway for years um, in non-malignant cells, I really like this figure that she made because it illustrates the complexity 
Each one of these lines um, with different colors represents an EGF repeat, and these are tandemly repeated. And um, each EGF repeat is about 38 amino acids. So they're very, very, this is, a, this is a large receptor. Lots of different glycosylation. That's the different colors represent different types of glycosylation. It interacts with a ligand on another cell, and that interaction is glycan to protein. And that interaction exposes the receptor for proteases that cleave, and this little piece goes to the nucleus and regulates genes. This pathway is very important for stem cells um, because it's, it's, it's very important for your normal, per, normal production of cells in embryology. So um, we were curious about the MGAT3 gene that I was telling you about and how its expression correlates with patient survival. And we also looked at radical fringe. You're going to find out what kind of glycosyl transfers, transferase this is in a minute. So these are two different glycosyl transferases that glycosylate the notch receptor. And you can see that each one of them, when they're expressed at high levels, um, so the red is the uh, patients with high expression, they have much reduced overall survival and progression-free survival. And this is true of the radical fringe glycosyl transferase as well. So with this data, we can see in large numbers of patients that these glycan structures will impact the disease. So we teamed up with Robert Haltwanger, who is a specialist in studying the notch glycosylation. And he's a specialist in um, these fringe glycosyl transferases. So, um, O-fucose is the addition of these fuco structures to serines or threonines, and this happens inside the Golgi. And then these fringe enzymes, there are three different forms, lunatic fringe, manic fringe, and radical fringe. They can add the next sugar. And so why would you need three enzymes to do this? That's a very interesting question that he spent years trying to figure out. There seems to be a code. In ovarian cancer, interesting enough, all three of these are overexpressed. So we wanted to figure out how this is affecting ovarian cancer. The first thing we did was focus on radical fringe. And we did that because radical fringe glycosylates a specific EGF repeat on the receptor that's important for interaction with the ligand delta. And so we knew that this particular repeat would be one to look at and to see how this is affecting um, ovarian cancer. So we made a CRISPR-Cas9 mediated um, deletion of radical fringe. Um, so Lou has this labeled as a knockdown, but it's actually a CRISPR-Cas knockout. Um, and then we had our GNT3 shRNA suppression of GNT3. And then we have a parent cell that has no change in glycosyl transferases. We sent him these three cell lines and he does mass spectrometry also. He has already extracted his data here and put this into a graphical form. And what you can see is that the red color shows you the levels of ofucos, and the black is um, no ofucos. The green represents ofuco structures that have that radical fringe addition of this particular blue sugar called glucnec. Well, you can see that there's not a lot of change in the levels when you look at nor the, the the, the parent cell or the GNT3 suppressed cell, but you can see in the knockout, we have completely eliminated all of the um, fringe activity. And there's a significant amount that has no ofucos. And so this is highly significant. Another interesting thing about this finding is that I told you there were two other fringe enzymes that are overexpressed in ovarian cancer in these cells, and they did not compensate for this. So that that's very interesting. Um, so Bob Haltewanger also figured out ways to measure ligand binding quantitatively with flow cytometry. This is just a figure from one of his prior publications. He has fluorescent um, ligands that he can use to see um, what the level of binding is. And in these uh, same cells that we sent him, we find that the jagged binding to the ovarian cancer cells is significantly changed in the GNT3 knockdown and then the radical fringe knockout. So this indicates that the two different glycan structures are each contributing differently to um, the notch activation. The delta binding to the ovarian cancer cells, it turns out that it was primarily just the radical fringe knockout that affected the delta binding. 
and not the GNT3. So again, two different glycan structures affecting the um, activation of this receptor in very different ways. So Zhongping Lu, who's do, been doing all this work, he then wanted to say, how does the how does the knockdown of these glycosyl transferases affect the amount of ovarian cancer stem cells? So cancer stem cells in ovarian cancer is very highly correlated with aldehyde dehydrogenase activity. And so we used an assay called Aldered. And in this assay, um, they send you a um, it's a substrate that is fluorescently labeled. It's non-toxic and it enters the cells and it becomes um, altered by the aldehyde dehydrogenase activity and then it will fluoresce. And you have um, an inhibitor that inhibits the acti activity of aldehyde dehydrogenase so that you can see where the population is. And in the control cells, there's plenty of cancer stem cells shown in blue. In the radical fringe knockout, there is a large reduction in the cancer stem cells. And in the GNT3 shRNA knockdown, there is almost a complete elimination of cancer stem cells. So these findings are highly significant because, as I mentioned earlier, the cancer stem cells are what is thought to be responsible for the chemo resistance and the recurrence of this disease. And there's not a lot of drugs that can target that. So we had the other question, do the levels of MGAT3 change in the cancer stem cell populations? So the previous figure was showing you the, you know, if you, if you eliminate these glycosyl transferases, you've reduced the, the stem cell numbers. What we're asking now is if you just take the parent cells and you grow them as attached cells, you can put them on the non-adherent dishes and make spheroids. You can sort them into the cancer stem cell fraction and the non-cancer stem cell fraction. He made um, mRNA and um, protein for all of these samples and measured the levels of MGAT3. And you can see that from the attached cells to the spheroid, there is an increase significant in the MGAT3. And when he sorted those spheroids, most of it is in the cancer stem cell fraction and not the non-cancer stem cell. He looked at the levels of GNT3 using an antibody to the protein, and they also correlate with these results. So this is highly significant because it says that most likely these abnormal glycan structures are going to be found in the cancer stem cells. So we needed to be able to target this abnormal glycan structure. We turned our attention to collaboration with an immunologist, um, Natalie Scholler, and she had created a yeast display library of single chain FB that were isolated from the B cells of ovarian cancer patients. And using her library, we panned, uh, we did subtraction multiple rounds and enrichment multiple rounds. And this has all been published in 2019. So you can go to the publication. Um, and we isolated um, eventually a clone that could bind to the ovarian cancer bisecting structures. And we converted that into a soluble single chain FB antibody with tags. I just want to point out it has one biotin accepting site. So it can have one biotin when we express and purify this, making it very quantitative. So we then looked to see, can it target tumors in vivo in mice? Um, and so before I show you the data, I want to say, what would be the translational potential of a single chain FB? These are small antibodies um, that can enter cells. Um, and they're very exciting because you can develop all kinds of new therapeutic strategy, strategies. So that's that's number one. Um, number two, you can develop diagnostic assays um, for plasma. Remember, I told you serum and plasma are a lot more complex. So but now we now we know what we're targeting. Now we have an antibody. Um, and then eventually, because you isolated the antibody from a single chain of B library, it says that pan cancer patients were making antibodies. You could develop vaccination strategies. So we initially wanted to show that this, this, this single chain FB known as clone nine can target the, the tumors. So we used human ovarian cancer cell line and we created a subcutaneous xenograft in an immunocompromised mouse. And we showed that the antibody can, through the vasculature, target the tumor nicely. Now, this is not a therapeutic study because this is a one-time injection um, for imaging. Um, and so you can see that it does. Um, so we haven't done any therapeutic studies with the single chain FB by itself yet. Um, this is just showing that it doesn't target other areas in the mouse. 
Then we use a syngenaic orthotopic model, which is the Luke ID8 model, um, to show that in an immune competent mouse, we can also target it. So this is an intra ovarian tumor, and you can see that the antibody targets. This is intraperitoneal injection because the cancer, ovarian cancer spreads very often in the intraperitoneal cavity. And you can see again, it targets the cancer. So this is exciting data and um, that was published in 2019 and I just got to FIU last year. And Robert Saxteen, I'm very excited to be working with him. He's a very talented um, bone marrow specialist, trained immunologist, glycobiologist, and he had published a very important paper in 2019. Um, and th in this paper, he found that the process for making a chimeric activated T cell or CAR T therapy, they have to take the patient's white cells. They have to activate the T cells and they have to expand the T cells. And what he found was that during this process, they were losing a key glycan structure known as Sile Lewis X shown here. And these, these, um, these expanded T cells didn't have it. Um, they were a type two sile lactosamine. So what is the consequence of that? Well, the consequence is this structure can bind to E-selectin and other ligands and get into um, the vascular beds and the bone marrow, and this structure doesn't. And so he was able to use addition of GDP fucose, a nucleotide sugar, and addition of purified um, glycosyl transferases known as fucosyl transferases, and he was able to add that fucose. And um, when he did that to the T cells and put them into mouse models, they were able to home where they are supposed to be to be active. So this paper really shows that a lot of the CAR T therapies and clinical trials that are being done may have this problem. And so um, I'm going to pair up with um, Robert Saxton, and we're gonna use the variable heavy and variable light chains from my antibody to create a type four um, CAR T molecule that we can express in the T cells and um, we can express the correct Sia Lewis X structure on these T cells, either by exophocosylation like this or from constitutively expressing these fucosyl transferases. And with this, we think that we can have a much better um, CAR T therapy. So how is this important for solid tumors like ovarian cancer? It's very important because these cancers are fed by vascular beds and um, E-selectin has been used to identify those vascular beds for years. So we know that they're there and this will improve the CAR T therapeutics. The next area we're focusing on is the blood test, the diagnostic assays. Um, so in blood, um, most people aren't aware of it, but 98% uh, of the proteins in your blood are, you know, housekeeping genes like albumin, um, proteins like albumin that you're not interested in. They're not the biomarker. So you have to find a way to get rid of all those abundant proteins to get to your biomarkers. And in recent years, it's been discovered that exosomes, small extracellular vesicles, you can see them here, bud off of cells. And these extra, extracellular vesicles are the way that cells communicate with each other. The problem is that in a, in a patient, their normal tissues are going to put out um, extracellular vesicles. And the cancer will also put out extracellular ves vesicles. We call them exosomes. So how can you um, get just the cancer exosomes? That is the question. So for ovarian cancer, we can get blood and ascites as samples that will yield exosomes. And um, if you hear the term liquid biopsy, what they're talking about is these exosomes. They contain tumor glycoproteins and they contain the RNA inside the exosome. And they're very important for a lot of ways because um, they're becoming more and more important for prognosis, diagnosis, monitoring patients, um, therapy selection, because we now know that these um, extra RNAs, especially the epigenetic you know, RNAs, are, are, are playing an important role in the outcomes for cancer. What I found was that a lot of the glycoproteins I had identified in, by mass spectrometry are also found on the exosomes. So we know that these abnormal glycan structure that I told you about, the bisecting structures, will be on the exosomes. 
So we have paired up, again, collaboration is key, with two very um, impressive scientists, Andrew Godwin, who um, is a is a very um, prominent ovarian cancer researcher at um, University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, and he has longitudinal samples from women that before they even get cancer, which are very valuable. And Yang Zheng at University of Florida is a very talented biomedical engineer. And he has created a system to um, allow you to microfluidically separate these exosomes in the plasma. Because in the laboratory, we usually, you would have to spin them for hours at a very high speed, and that's not really practical for a lab test. So this is a, a very impressive um, thing that they've done. They published this work again, 2019, before the pandemic, everything happened. And um, so that work has just started and we're hoping that our antibody will allow us to capture the tumor exosomes. Um, so we're, we're very excited about this collaboration. And so in conclusion, um, we can say that glycans change significantly in cancer, making them biomarkers. And these biomarkers can be used for detection of cancer and therapeutics. Um, the cancer stem cell fraction has increased levels of these tumor specific bi bisecting structures, which is very um, important and could allow us to have a new way to target these cancer stem cells. So remember at the very beginning of the talk, I told you that traditional chemotherapy does not target the cancer stem cells. Well, we could feasibly combine our therapeutic with traditional chemotherapy and knock everything out at once. Um, the combination of targeting the um, tumor-specific glycan structures with a, a new type of CAR-T with the glycoengineering of the T-cells um, to allow for more accumulation of those um, T-cells at the tumor beds could allow for much more improved immunotherapy, not just for ovarian cancer, but for all solid tumors. Um, so this, is, this, this will be a win-win for a lot of different cancers. And tumor-specific glycans can be used to fractionate um, tumor-derived exosomes. And by doing that, you really drive down and improve the sensitivity because you get rid of all the background. And so the new liquid biopsy should, should involve um, using, um, remember I told you lectins can't do this. We need more antibodies that recognize these tumor-specific glycans, but ways to fractionate those tumor-specific glycans away from the normal um, um, exosomes is really going to improve that. And finally, just acknowledge our funding um, over the years and our many collaborators. Um, and um, yep, and I think we're going to do questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Abbott. That was uh, really quite interesting. And I'm sure that um, your talk has sparked um, a lot of questions from our audience. For our listeners, you can submit um, any question or comment that you have for either of our speakers in the Q&A tab, which you can see on the right side of your screen. And now I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Susan Bellis. Dr. Bellis is a professor in the Department of Cell Developmental and Integrative Biology and the Alma B. Maxwell Endowed Chair at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The Bellis Lab studies the effects of N-glycan composition on the structure and function of key cell surface receptors involved in neoplastic transformation. Dr. Bellis's research has been supported by the NIH, the Department of Defense, American Heart Association, and other agencies. In addition, Dr. Bellis serves on multiple grant review panels and editorial boards, and she is the associate editor for the Journal of Ovarian Cancer. Finally, she is the 2022 president-elect of the Society for Glycobiology. Dr. Bellis, let's make sure that your slides are up and running. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, let's see where we still, uh, yeah, that looks great on my end. Okay. The stage is yours, Dr. Ellis. All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm excited to, to be here to tell you about this uh, exciting field that Karen and I are in. And I would say I'm, I'm kind of the yang to Karen's yang, and I know Karen very well. So my lab, so Karen does a lot of translational work, 
And I am really at heart a basic cell biologist. And so I'm very interested in how these sugar structures act at the cellular level of a tumor cell to change the gene expression and cell signaling and, and, um, and then cancer cell behavior. So let me just start by um, saying, and Karen had mentioned this, that actually a change in the cell surface glycans was one of the earliest identified hallmarks of a tumor cell. So we've known these sugars change for decades. And today uh, in the clinic, even, well, even today, the, the sugar structures are really important clinical indicators of cancer progression or recurrence. And glycans have long been used as reporters for changes in cell differentiation state, for example, reporting stem cell status. But unfortunately, there's still uh, limited knowledge about the functional effects of aberrant glycosylation on tumor cell behavior. So it is changing, which we're grateful for, but it still remains one of the least investigated areas in cancer research. And so, as Karen alluded to, these changes are not random. There is a distinct subset of these glycosylating enzymes that changes in cancer. And so my lab studies one of these cancer-associated enzymes, and the name of that enzyme is ST6GAL1. So just to give you a little bit of glycobiology, I won't go into details, but ST6GAL1 is a silyl transferase and it adds an alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid to N-glycosylated proteins. So this is just a representative N-glycan. Uh, as Karen said, they're heterogeneous. You can have two to four branches. They can vary in length, but the chain terminates in galactose or that galactose can be capped with a number of different sugars, but one of those sugars is sialic acid. And sialic acid is noteworthy because it is a large sugar and it is negatively charged. And so because of its charge and position at the end of the chain, it can have many different effects on glycoprotein structure and therefore function. Now the 2,6 linkage uh, comes about from the, uh, the specific biochemistry of this. So the sialic acid, carbon-2 of sialic acid, is added to carbon-6 of galactose. And outside of the brain, ST6GAL1 seems to be uh, the predominant, if not the only, enzyme that directs this linkage. And that is in contrast to alpha-2,3-linked sialic acid, which is added by multiple silyl transferases. So the effects of SD6GAL1 are, are not usually compensated by other enzymes. Oh, like other uh, silyl transferases, ST6 is in the Golgi, and so it adds these, this sugar structure to proteins bound for the plasma membrane or secretion. And so just a quick reminder that free cytosolic proteins are not N-glycosylated, so they don't carry the sugar structure. Okay, I wanna say just a little bit of a word about these two different sialic acid linkages. And so first of all, it's important to note that these, the alpha 2 3 linked sialic acid and the alpha 2 6 linked sialic acid, they occupy different positions in space. That bond to galactose places them in a different place. And so because of this, it, these could have very different effects on protein structure. And there's a lot of evidence that they do. So, you know, it, I think there is a misconception uh, sometimes that these N-glycans extend out away from the surface protein. And uh, many times they do, we draw them this way. And many N-glycans do exactly this, they extend out they don't interact much with the protein backbone. They wave around a lot, but that's not true of all N-glycans. Many N-glycans are found within pockets within the protein and make direct contacts with amino acid sequences. And so N can play really important structural roles uh, in um, the, the glycoprotein. And so that bond may be quite important in terms of where those types of N-glycans are positioned. So these two linkages can also be biologically different because they bind to different glycan binding proteins. So there are some glycan binding proteins that just bind 2,3, some bind 2,6, 
some bind both. But these glycan proteins, just as one example, the siglic family of mammalian lectins, these play huge roles in immune response and particularly anti-tumor um, immune response. And so um, this, these two linkages are not always biologically equivalent. Now, I do want to just kind of give you an example of where the N-glycan or an N-glycan is really important in the structure of a receptor. And I'm going to just talk about the EGFR receptor, which our lab has shown is activated when it gets the 2,6-silic acid. And I'll talk more about that later on. But it's well known in the field that EGFR is held in an inactive EGFR monomer through something called the autoinhibitory tether. And that is in fact held together by an N-glycan. And if you mutate this uh, sequence and delete that N-glycan, that activates, it opens up the structure and activates EGF, EGFR. So it opens up EGFR and that helps EGFR form the active dimer. So there is a specific N-glycan right in that pocket in that dimerization arm. And so one of the questions is, well, could the actual structure of that N-glycan and or the sialic acid linkage actually affect the autoinhibitory tether? So if you had a very bulky N-glycan, would it disrupt the tether and activate EGFR? Or would the 2,6 bond put that sialic acid in a different place than the 2,3? So these are important questions to, to ask. And unfortunately, we have very, very little structural data with intact glycans. It, it's technically easy to delete an N-glycan. It's not so technically easy to, to really manipulate the actual glycan structure. And so as many of you may know, uh, almost, well, most of our X-ray crystallography structures are, are lacking the glycans because usually they're removed enzymatically because they interfere with crystal formation. So those of you who are structurally inclined out there, we desperately need structural information about how different glycan structures affect the actual conformation or folding of the glycoprotein. So one thing I'm very hopeful about is cryo-EM. So cryo-EM has advanced so much in recent years, and you can do this with the native glycan structures. And so I'm hoping as we go forward in this field, we're going to be able to understand how a protein changes its shape with different sugar structures. And so I think that's a, an important area of need in our field. But getting back to the enzyme that we work on, it's been known again for many decades that ST6GAL1 mRNA levels are upregulated in numerous cancers. Unfortunately, we really didn't have good antibodies for this until the past uh, eight or nine years or so, but there is a good one now. And so what you see in many cancers, you see this very distinct on-off switch where you cannot detect the, the uh, enzyme in the normal differentiated epithelium, but it comes very strongly on uh, in, in the tumor. And we and others have shown that this correlates with a poor patient prognosis. Interestingly, again, now that we have an antibody, we've learned in recent years that you also see high expression in, in many stem progenitor niches. And to solidify this observation, my group uh, took fibroblasts and transduced with the four Yamanaka factors to reprogram the cells into induced pluripotent stem cells. And I think you can appreciate that you have a very strong upregulation of ST6GAL1 in the stem cells. And right around this time, uh, Hirabayashi's group showed that you really have a very dramatic change in the sialic acid linkage from 2,3 to 2,6. And then Wong's group showed that if you knock down ST6, this inhibits um, that transition to pluripotency. And because of this link to, cancer, to stem cells, we hypothesized that the enzyme would impart a cancer stem cell phenotype. Karen's talked about that a lot. I won't, I'll just very briefly summarize this. But we showed in a number of different types of models that ST6 promotes all of these hallmark cancer stem cell features like expression of classic markers, tumor initiate, 
initiating potential, and then resistance to, to really many cell stressors like chemotherapy and hypoxia, et cetera. Okay, so we know something about the pathways through which ST6 alters tumor cell behavior. So we and others have shown that when the beta-1 integrin gets the 2,6-silic acid, it promotes cell migration and invasion. The 2,6-silation activates the EGFR receptor and cell survival. And the 2,6-silation also blocks the ability of TNFR1 and FAST to internalize, and in this way, blocks apoptosis and instead switches the signaling towards survival. So that the TNFR1 FAST is all unpublished data. I mean, it's all published data. So the net effect here is really to confer a more invasive apoptosis resistant phenotype. So one of the first take home points then is we think that SD6 is acting as a kind of master regulator, acting, acting at the level of cell surface receptors to change signal transduction and consequently gene transcription to make cells more stem-like. And two of the key pathways we think are TNFR1 signaling through NF-kappa B and EGFR signaling through ERK and AKT. And again, there's a lot of published work summarized here. Okay, but today, I, you know, we've worked in a number of different cancer models, but, but today I'm just going to focus on pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or abbreviated PDAC. And so by conferring this cancer stem cell-like phenotype, we think that the enzyme acts uh, during both tumor initiation through a process called acinartoductal metaplasia, which I'll talk about a good bit, and also metastatic progression through epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which I'll just touch on briefly. But both of these processes really involve a, a cell becoming more stem-like. Okay, so I'm showing you again that the enzyme is upregulated in human PDAC tissues. And again, the, the staining is in the gold, co-localizes with Golgi markers. And so we've quantified that staining and you see that the enzyme is strongly upregulated at the earliest stages of the tumor, stage one, and levels further increase as you get to the advanced tumor. And we've also done some work uh, showing a pro-tumorigenic role for the enzyme in xenograft models. And so first of all, as you might imagine, most human PDAC cell lines have pretty high levels of st 6 gal one except for this odd SUT2 cell line which has pretty low endogenous expression and low metastatic potential. And because of this low metastatic potential, other groups have used uh, in vivo iterative selection methods to isolate metastatic subclones. And very interestingly, you see that st 6 gal one expression is very strongly upregulated in all of the metastatic subclones, suggesting it's selected for during metastatic progression. So to study st 6 gal ones uh, tumorigenic potential, we have overexpressed the enzyme in the parental line and knocked it down in two of these metastatic subclones. And we published some work showing that high st 6 expression in all three of these cell models activates EGFR and promotes EMT. And then in unpublished work, we've used these cell lines in xenograft models. I'm just gonna show a couple of these in the interest of time. And so this is with the SUT2 parental line when we overexpress st 6 gal one and we inject the cells into the pancreas, you see much greater growth of the pancreatic tumor. If you image the livers at the endpoint directly, you see more metastasis to the liver. And contrarily, if you knock the enzyme down in one of these metastatic lines, it uh, uh, inhibits tumor growth in the pancreas and inhibits metastasis. And we see really essentially the same results in the other metastatic line. Okay, so more recently we've developed a transgenic mouse model. And so we use PDX1 CRE to knock in st 6 gal one expression in the pancreas. And so I'm showing you the acinar cells. And so mice like humans, they do not have any detectable st 6 gal one in the acinar cells, that's the predominant epithelial cell type in the pancreas. And now you see in the knock-in mouse, you see st 6 gal one here abnormally. We're referring to these as SC mice for st 6 gal one and Cree. 
And we did show through lectin staining, particularly SNA, that dissociated cells from the pancreas do have more surface alpha-2,6 silation. And I should say that there's now been um, some glycomics analyses, not from us, but other groups, showing that this increase in 2,6 silation is one of the predominant changes in pancreatic cancer and human pancreatic cancer. All right, and so then to study cancer progression, we cross these SC mice to this really classic KC PDAC model. So that stands for KRAS and Cree. And so these mice have oncogenic KRAS in the pancreas. They first develop these very early neoplastic lesions called panins that later progress to PDAC. And so if you look in the KC mice, now remember, this does not have the ST6 knock-in. This is just the KRAS. And what you see is endogenous ST6 GAL1 is upregulated in these panins, but not in the normal acinar cells. So the enzyme comes up in the earliest stages of neoplasia. And so the mice with both ST6 knock-in and KRAS are referred to as KSC mice. And so as you age the mice, you see that the KSC mice have greatly accelerated PDAC progression and mortality. And if you look at an age match cohort, you see much more extensive disease in the KSC mice and fibrosis, whereas KC mice have mostly early stage panins shown here. And we had a pathologist grade our tissues under blinded conditions. And so the KSC mice have more advanced grade panins at 20 weeks, and at 20 weeks, the majority of the KSC mice have adenocarcinoma and distal metastases, whereas the, none of the KSC mice have these features at 20 weeks. All right, so given what we know about ST6GAL1's function and conferring a, a stem or progenitor-like phenotype, we hypothesize the enzyme might participate in acinar to ductal metaplasia, or ADM. And this is one of the earliest events that leads to uh, cancer initiation. And so in the normal pancreas, what happens is, is when the pancreas is injured, either due to inflammation or some other type of damage, these acinar cells dedifferentiate and they acquire these stem-like ductal cell properties. And in the normal pancreas, that typically plays a role in regeneration. So it's a transient process, and then the acinar cells redifferentiate. But if these cells undergo this kind of ADM transition and they get a KRAS mutation, then they go on to form the panin lesions and then uh, PDAC. And so you can monitor ADM by measuring the down regulation of acinar markers like PTF1A and the upregulation of stem and ductal markers like SOX9. And so it's important to know that SOX9 is not just a marker for ADM, it is actually a functional driver of ADM. That's been known through a number of different papers. And it's also important for maintaining our, you know, your normal pancreatic progenitor pools. And we were first interested in ADM because we've shown in other studies that ST6GAL1 activity promotes SOX9 expression in a wide range of cell models. And so we looked in our tissues for not SOX9 expression. And so I want to highlight these are the SC mice, so just ST6GAL1 knock-in. There's no KRAS, oncogenic KRAS here, and there's no evidence of malignancy. These mice are at 20 weeks, age matched again. There's no evidence of malignancy here in these mice. And yet you have a very strong upregulation of SOX9, which is a nuclear transcription factor. And so that is a quantitatively quite, quite a striking difference. We also see the upregulation of many other ductal markers, such as cytokeratin-19. And so you don't find cytokeratin-19, KRT you don't find it in the normal acinar cells, and neither do you find uh, SD6-GAL1. But in the SC mice with SD6-GAL1, now you see a strong regulation of this KRT-19. So this suggests that even in the absence of inflammation or an oncogene, that ST6 activity is making these cells more stem and ductal-like. We've also done RNA-seq on 20-week-old pancreata, and we see in the SC mice a very strong activation of many stem cell pathways, a pancreatic ductal 
uh, cell pathway and at actually at least eight different types of cancers. Those pathways, including pancreatic, those pathways are activated, suggesting that ST6GAL1 is doing something to activate pathways that are associated with neoplastic development. If you do a heat map for the ductal gene network, you see that very clearly the ductal gene network has been activated in the SC mice. I just want to highlight a few of these ductal genes, SOX9, of course, but also TGF-alpha and EGFR. So TGF-alpha is a ligand for EGFR, and it's actually well known that TGF-alpha activation of EGFR is one of the key pathways that drives ADM. We've also used organoid models to study ADM. So we developed organoids from our mouse models. And so what happens is it's really the stem progenitor cells that form these organoids, but they're advantageous because wild type uh, cells will grow in organoid culture. So you don't have to immortalize the cells to, to look at signaling. And so what you find is that it, we initially looked at uh, organoid formation and you find that the SC cells form more organoids than wild type, KSC more than KC. So this is an indirect measure of self-renewal potential. You can track organoid growth over time, and you can see that the SC organoids grow better than the wild type and KSC better than KC. And then if you look at gene expression, you see that the SC organoids have more SOX9 and less PTF1A, suggesting a stem ductal phenotype. Now, we didn't see major changes in gene expression in KC and KSC, perhaps because KRAS itself upregulates stem and ductal markers. But then we asked the question, well, if you have organoids with KRAS, do you still need ST6GAL1 for stemness properties? And so what we did was to knock down ST6 expression in the KC organoids and this inhibited organoid formation, organoid growth over time, and flip the... Uh, genotype to a more Asinar-like genotype indicated by PTF1A upregulation. And so we've also tested this in uh, the 266 Asinar cell line, which is a common model for ADM. And what you find is if you knock down SD6, you downregulate SOX9, increase PTF1A, where the inverse is true when you overexpress the enzyme. And then finally, we've used this uh, in, in vivo model for ADM where you induce inflammation with seriline. This causes pancreatic uh, inflammation and causes those acinar cells to de-differentiate into a more stem ductal phenotype. And they re-enter this, some of the cells re-enter to the cell cycle to help repopulate the, uh, pan the pancreatic acinar compartment. And so you see that the seriline causes damage to the acinar cells here. And then if you stain for markers, uh, ADM markers, which is uh, um, really demarcated by the co-expression of amylase, the acinar marker, and SOX9, you never find SOX9 in a normal acinar cell. And so here is in the saline. Um, but here, when you inject with seriline, now you see SOX9 coming up in the amylase positive cells. And so if you look in a wild type mouse, and so again, this is just endogenous ST6GAL1, you find that like SOX9, the endogenous ST6GAL1 is strongly upregulated in these ADM-like lesions uh, during conditions of pancreatic inflammation. So this is really identifying this enzyme as a novel marker for ADM-like cells. But then we tested whether it actually functionally contributes to ADM, and we did this by comparing ADM and wild-type SC mice, and you can quantify the ADM-like cells by co-staining for an acinar marker, you, uh, which are glycan ligands for the UA lectin and the expression of CD133, and so the double positive cells are the ADM-like cells. And so here's just a representative run, but across three independent runs, you see that the SC mice do have more ADM-like cells. Okay, so I showed you through a number of models that ST6GAL1 uh, promotes this more stem and ductal-like phenotype. And so what's the mechanism here? So we're obviously interested in EGFR for a number of reasons. One is because, as I've told you, this is a predominant pathway in ADM. 
The second is because our RNA sequencing results did show that EGFR is activated in SC mice and in um, in vitro studies, looking at the mechanism of the effects of silation on EGFR, we have shown that that alpha-2,6 silation stabilizes the active EGFR dimer and also promotes EGFR recycling to the cell surf surface. And so this is unpublished, uh, uh, in some, some published, some unpublished data looking at the mechanism by which silation affects EGFR. And unfortunately, I, I don't have time to go into the, the, the cell signaling part of this. But we looked in our tissues then, and what you find is there's very strong activation of EGFR in the acinar cells of SC mice, undetectable in the acinar cells of wild-type mice. And similarly, in the adjacent non-malignant tissue, the normal appearing acinar cells, there's no phospho-EGFR in KC acinar cells, but again, strong upregulation or strong activation of EGFR in mice with ectopic ST6 expression. And then um, here's just the total EGFR. Now, if you look in the neoplastic lesions of KC mice, you do see activation of EGFR. That's well known. You also see upregulation of endogenous ST6 GAL1. But the, the striking finding here is in the quote unquote normal or certainly the non-malignant acinar cells, ectopic expression of ST6 in both models activates EGFR. And this is reinforced by Western blotting in our organoid models, where once again, you see very strong activation of EGFR in the SC and the KSC organoids. All right, and so in ongoing studies then, we are trying to better understand how the silation dependent activation of EGFR is uh, altering intracellular signaling and gene expression to, to drive ADM as an initiating event and ultimately PDAC initiation. So I will wrap up with a working model for um, our work. So what we think is that ST6GAL1 becomes upregulated, and we certainly know it, come, it becomes upregulated in cancer. That's known for a long time. What's new here is the finding that it comes up during pancreatic injury and perhaps plays a role in regeneration. We're testing that right now. But when ST6 comes up, this leads to the silation of a number of different receptors, including EGFR, leading to the activation of AKT and other pathways. And we certainly don't think that EGFR is the only target meeting, mediating the biology of this enzyme. There are certainly others that contribute to uh, cell phenotype. But in any case, once that happens, you get a reprogramming of the cells to make the cells more stem-like. And then if those cells are more stem-like, and they acquire an oncogenic mutation, then they may undergo neoplastic transformation. So it's really well known in the field that ADM-like cells are particularly vulnerable to oncogenic transformation compared to differentiated acinar cells. And so most of the work I talked about today was conducted by Nikita Valerio, Michael Marcial, Asmi Chakraborty. We're very grateful to our funding sources and collaborators. And actually just kind of spinning off of something Karen said, in collaborative work with Bob Coffey at Vanderbilt, we showed that the SD6GAL1 enzyme is in exosomes and can be transferred to recipient cells and it is active in those recipient cells and causes increased surface silation, suggesting a mechanism where the SD6GAL1 uh, enzyme can actually be transferred among various tumor cell or stromal populations. So I will go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Bellis. Um, we have already received a number of questions from our audience, but just as a reminder, if you still have any questions or comments, please do feel free to um, submit them in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. Uh, in the 15 or so minutes that we have left, let's uh, let's move into our Q&A session. Um, Dr. Bellis, let's start with, with a question for you. Um, you've shown um, uh, in many different ways that SD6GAL1 um, expression is, is a driver for, for cancer progression. Do you have any ideas what could um, initially induce this uh, increase in expression? 
Um, yeah, so if you mean what are the mechanisms that drive up this expression, and I think the corollary question is, what keeps it very low in, in a differentiated epithelial cell? The truth is there's just not been a lot of work in, in that area. We desperately need more. My group has shown that the SOX2 stem cell factor induces upregulation of SD6-GAL1. We and other groups, at least three groups, have shown that the KRAS oncogene itself can upregulate ST6-GAL1. And in differentiated epithelium, this may be due certainly in part to hypermethylation of the promoter. And so, so in terms of the mechanisms that we, those are just some examples. In terms of biological stimuli, um, again, it's well known in cancer, but it's it's and it's known in many immune cell populations that it's higher in stem cell uh, in immune cell types as well, and then drops. But in terms of biological stimulus, there's there's not a lot known outside of cancer. So good question. Lots to do. Lots of work to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to connect your talk to uh, Dr. Abbott's, have you looked at notch activation upon upregulation of SD6 GAL1? Oh, very, very briefly. We have some, just a little bit of preliminary data, I think from, I can't remember if it's from the mouse models or our cell models, but we do see some evidence that notch may be activated uh, at the, and, and we've looked at actually the signaling level, the RNA-seq in the animal models suggests that notch pathway is activated. But other than that, we don't have any understanding of mechanism or whether that's just secondary to a stem cell reprogramming or whether it's playing a direct role in either the notch ligands or the notch receptor. So we don't, we don't know. I feel like I'm saying we don't know a lot. <laughs> That means there's a lot of uh, room for more research still. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Abbott, I have a question for you um, related to um, your work on notch activation. Um, I would assume that targeting notch activation would be challenging because um, you know uh, notch activity regulates some cell homeostasis in many different tissues. Could you comment on how you would how you would approach that? Yeah, I mean, well, we've identified that notch receptor in ovarian cancer cells has the abnormal bisecting structure. So if we are targeting um, the notch receptor with that antibody, then we won't be targeting normal notch. I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, um, to follow up on that question with the, the bisecting glycans and the, the tumor-specific antibodies, could you could you talk about the sensitivity and the specificity of the antibody that you've um, identified? So single-chain FV antibodies are really good for in vivo work, but not as good for in vitro. I didn't really talk about this as much. So we're working with Harvard and they've created an FC fusion version of our antibody. And we're working with them to get at the, um, at the specificity, number one, um, they've used it on, they have glycan arrays from every glycan from normal mammalian cells, and it does not bind to normal glycans. So we do know that, <laughs> but they don't have cancer arrays. So um, we don't, we don't, um, we don't have an ability right now to, to do the specificity on a cancer array. And um, again, you, you know, measuring the affinity um, the single chain FV, we are not measuring the affinity because that's the um, in vivo work. In, vi in vitro, we hope in my lab to be able to get some um, measurements of this new FC version doing ELISAS, but we haven't done that yet. Thank you. I was, I was also wondering if you could comment on the prevalence of such bisecting glycans in different tumor types. Okay, so we, that's a good question. Um, we know for a fact that it is in glioblastoma and it is also in lung cancer. Um, we have actually done the targeting of the antibody in um, lung cancer xenografts in mice and it, it targets lung cancer as well, not, not 
non, um, you know, squamous cell lung cancer. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's going to be useful for multiple cancers and all of those cancers also share the same epigenetic mechanism to turn on the MGAT3 gene. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bellis, a question for you. Um, when you look at your SD6 GAL1 knocking animals, the ones that don't have KRS activation, do you see any abnormality in the pancreases of these mice with age? Why, yes, we do. <laughs> so this is kind of, you know, it's preliminary work with this is ongoing, but you know, they do have reduced survival and you have to age them. You know, the median survival of the cohorts we have so far is somewhere around a year and a half, uh, maybe a year and four months, something like that. I mean, we're still expanding the cohort, as you might imagine. It's taken a long time to do these studies, but it's clearly lower than a, a wild type mouse. And when you look at the pancreas, um, uh, it, it, this is very preliminary. It looks like about half have pancreatic cancer when they die. Uh, and But we're trying to get harder numbers on that um, certainly many of them do. The penetrants we're still trying to figure out. All of them have pancreatic abnormalities. We see immune infiltration uh, in, some, in some of the mice that don't look like they have full-blown adenocarcinoma. We do see immune infiltration. So right now what we're trying to do is timed sacs where we sack at six months, nine months, 12, et cetera. So we can, with much larger, larger cohorts, and working with a pathologist and looking at markers, you know, staining with biomarkers to see if we can get a better handle on what exactly this enzyme is doing as the animals age. Thank you. Um, here's a question about the experiment where you reduce SD6-GAL1 expression in KRS mutant cells um, to show that it reduces the malignant behavior of these cells. Have you analyzed um, whether in these cells um, EGFR activation is changed or if there are any other pathways that are altered? Oh yeah, that's a great question. We, yeah, we do need to go back with that model, I think, um, with a KC model and knock down SD6. It, uh, honestly, unlike our uh, SC, KSC lines, when you knock down SD6 in the KC lines, they don't actually, the organoids don't survive very long, only a few passages and then they're, then they're gone. So we have to kind of do our, our experiments like right away versus carrying the KC line itself will carry fine through multiple passages, but not if you knock down SD6 GAL1. We do need to go back and do more analyses on those, both at the transcriptomics level and EGFR activation. It's a really important thing to do. One of the things we've really run into is we can't get our hands on Matrigel right now because of supply chain issues, which is so frustrating. So we're sort of stymied at the moment, but good question. Okay, thank you. Um, um, a question for Dr. Abbott now. Um, you talked about P53 and uh, BRCA1 mutation and mentioned that those um, don't really drive tumorigenic potential. Could you comment on what drive means in this context and why you think that these um, mutations, sorry, these GTs do this more than P53 and BRCA? So sure, um, yeah, the mutation um, is, is something that happens in, and, and it's one of the initiating events in the development of ovarian cancer. So it identifies the clonal cancer cells, but it doesn't correlate with the aggressiveness of the cancers. And there is, so that it, um, it, 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 is, it is an important factor and they've actually identified um, actual somatic P53 mutations um, in pap specimens um, from women. Um, and a study was recently published. Um, so so it, it, it is an important marker but it does not seem to correlate with the um, uh, aggressive um, behavior of the cancers. So um, glycosyl transferases um, have a, a potential to do that because as I mentioned, they are controlling those cell structures, the shape of the cell. They're controlling the interactions uh, that stimulate the signaling pathway. So they, they would likely be having more of an impact on the tumorigenic um, potential because you don't, uh, form a cancer unless the cells are invasive. 
right, right. Thank you. Um, um, sorry, I lost my uh, train of thought here. Do we know, is there any data on whether hormones alter glycosylation status and if this could also drive um, further cancer progression? That's a very interesting question. Um, that was, uh, there was a poster presented at the latest glycobiology meeting from a group in Europe that has was looking at um, just IgGs isolated from the blood of postmenopausal woman women excuse me compared to premenopausal women and they did see changes in the glycosylation of IgG um, and the changes that they saw were a lack of glycosylate galactosylation so it is interesting because it, it, it draws to the question whether these changes that happen in aging are can are are making you more susceptible to carcinogenesis and I'll pop in. Uh, there, there was evidence going back quite a ways, suggesting that estrogen increases SD6 GAL1 expression. Although, the, unfortunately, it's not really been followed up too much. I always thought that was a, a a thread, a scientific thread that should have been followed up on. So, if anybody wants to do it out there, please do. <laughs> um, um, I also have a question about uh, targeting specificity. Um, since pharmacological modification of glycosylating enzymes would probably have many unintended consequences. So how would you go about uh, targeting such enzymes or glycosylation uh, or glycans uh, more specifically? And this is a question I guess for both of you. So let's let's start Dr. Bellis with you since your mic is still on. Yeah, sure. Um, there's a there's a there's been a lot of effort to try to get a drug that would only inhibit ST6 GAL1 and not other silyltransferases. It's a challenge. I don't think we really have one yet, but people are working actively on this question. Um, if you delivered it freely, you know, just uh, through the bloodstream, for example you probably would have some off-target effects. st 6 gal one is high in the liver and it is higher in, in a lot of immune cells. So there probably would be. So I think you'd have to like target it to the tumor cell with, you know, maybe in some kind of nanoparticle or something like that. Um, there's an interesting, there is an interesting mechanism, the therapeutic mechanism out of Carolyn Bertozzi's group that's now a company that called an Eagle reagent and some other variations of that where they actually have this taken, I think I'm getting too long here, sorry, but I'll try to be quick. They've made an, an engineered antibody where one of the fabs recognizes her too new to get it to the tumor and the other fab has been replaced by a sialidase enzyme to really strip the sialic acid off of the cell tumor cell surface without affecting other cells. So it's pretty interesting, pretty innovative. So I think there are some paths to target the, the SD6 GAL1 enzyme without, without really doing a lot of nonspecific damage. Anyway, sorry, that was a long answer. Karen, no, no, that ahead. was great. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Abbott, do you have anything you want to add? Glycosyl transferase enzymes that we talked about today are localized in the, in the Golgi, and they have a very, very small part that extends into the cytosol. So it would be um, very hard to target the enzyme, the protein. Um, actually, when I was a postdoc, there was a chemist that had made some compounds that he was trying to get into the Golgi. It's very hard to get things into the Golgi. So I would say that that would be difficult. But what Susan mentioned, um, you know, um, make mixing chimeras, like taking a tumor targeting antibody and then and then linking it to an enzyme that removes a, gly a glycan structure, it would be a more applicable um, approach. And also, you know, you can create mimetics that mimic glycan structures to block receptors. So you really have to think outside the box in terms of glycobiology and how you're going to approach the therapeutics. Thank you so much. Um, um, looking beyond cancer, I think we have we have uh, time for one last question, um, and that um, brings us back, like everything these days, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, are any of you aware of data um, showing SARS-CoV-2 receptor glycosylation and, and the significance of that? Let's uh, start with, doc with you, Dr. Abbott. 
So yes, the spike protein is definitely a glycoprotein and um, it's, it's well established that there's a glycan shield. And so that, that impairs the ability of antibodies to detect the spike protein. And it's really not been studied as well how the glycosylation changes in the cells that are infected by CoV-2. Um, so they primarily infect lungs, alveolar cells. And in, in biological sciences, we have very few culture models of that. So a lot of the preliminary studies have been done in other cell types. So I think this is an area that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bellis, do you have anything to add still? No, I think that was a, a great answer. It's certainly very important. The glycans are very important for uh, COVID. It's, it's actually quite a very active Active, a lot of work going on on that right now, the glycosylation of the spike protein. So if you're interested, take a look. There's, this is a very dynamic area of investigation. Great, um, thank you both so much. Unfortunately, um, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, if you still have any questions that we didn't manage to get to um, during our Q&A session, please do consider reaching out to our speakers directly. You can see their contact information shown on the screen right now. As a reminder, um, today's webinar will be archived on the website of The Scientist, and you will receive an email notifying you when our on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank um, everyone who took the time uh, to join us today. And on behalf of The Scientist, I would also like to thank our speakers, Drs. Karen Abbott and Susan Bellis, as well as our sponsor, Vector Laboratories. Thank you, ever, everyone, for tuning in today, and have a wonderful day. Goodbye.